Make room in your heart. Is there room in your heart? Um, kind of continue to go along with our theme. We'll say our theme for the month since we're not sure how long it's going to last. Sometimes they last longer than others, but it's definitely lasted this month. Uh, this is the fifth Sunday this month, or is this the fourth Sunday? This is the fifth Sunday, right? Right. So then we have next next week's February. That's weird. Um. And so, you know, this all started with the phrase, whom do you seek, rattling around in my mind, right? Whom do you seek? And is there room in your heart for whom you're seeking? Right? Hopefully, whom we're seeking is the whom, is, is Jesus, right? It's Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior. Uh, hopefully, uh, there isn't room in our heart because he's already filled it all the way up, right? We don't have to make room because he's already filled it. We already made the room and now he's filled it. And we just got to become more aware of the fact that he's already filled us with his presence and his love, his energy, however you want to think about it. Um, but then, uh, you know, so this week, so I, I forget what we were even talking about last week. It was like last week, and I was having some technical difficulties with the camera. It wasn't, it wasn't recording any sound. It was plugged in, but there was no sound. The Facebook was getting sound, so I know the mic's working. I know everything's working. And so this morning, I was trying to figure it out. I was putzing around with it, and then I took the, 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 the plug that plugs into the camera and unscrewed it, and both the wires that are soldered into the part that plugs in, both the wires had gotten disconnected. And uh, so I said, oh, that makes sense why I wouldn't be working if the wires aren't connected. And luckily, I had, like, three different backup cables, so I just put in the new backup cable, and now I have sound on my camera. So I can actually watch stuff back. Um, so I might remember it for more than a day. Um, but um, the idea going along is, hey, whom do we seek? You know, Jesus Christ, right? Uh, do we have room for him? Right? And that's the, the birth story of Jesus, right? There was no room for him in the end. Is there room for him in our end? Um, have we cleared out all the stuff that the world's accumulated in us to make sure that there's enough room for him in there? Um, and then there was, um, whom do you seek? What do you seek? Um, where do you seek? Um, and then we're going to come up on why do you seek? That would be an interesting one. Um, but this week, um, I, got, I had an interesting question from, from Mr. Andrew over there. Um, sent me the, the question about the first commandment. Now, I couldn't tell you how long it's been since I've read the Ten Commandments. They're not on my, my weekly reading list. Um, so I had to kind of refresh on them a little bit, which luckily it was only the first one, so I didn't have to refresh much. Um, and so then we had some interesting dialogue on that, but, you know, once again, it was also kind of registering in my mind of why is this passage coming into my what I call my consciousness now. And uh, so the first commandment is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And, uh, you know, so that's an interesting question. And so we had some discussion on it, just the two of us. I think Rob joined in a little bit Thursday night. And, um... You know, so one of the questions is, is, are there other gods out there? Why would he say you should have no other gods if, there's, if there are no other gods? If he's the only god, why is he saying don't have any other gods before me? And so are there these other forces out there, these other gods out there, these devils and demons and all these other spiritual being godlike creatures that exist actually in a, some kind of realm that are working on us to trawl us away from God's presence. Um, and for some, that might be the case. Uh, for others, it might mean something different. And so uh, I... Everybody hold on to your seat here for a moment. I kind of think about it a little bit differently. I know that's shocking to a lot of people that I would think differently. Um, but when I think about it it, it, it all comes back to, and I remember it was, it was several years ago, and I don't know why he was here. It might have been a conference that Pastor Ed was doing, or it might have, he might have just been filling in for one of the Sundays, because when Ed had the cancer, Roy, Roy filled in for him a few times. And um, But anytime Ed would do any kind of conference, he always included Roy, uh, Roy Kelsey, if you don't remember who Roy was. 
Um, so this is really early on in, in my in my Christian journey. <laughs> <clears throat> is one of the very first things I remember, but he said, and I, and I quoted it many times, he said, if God isn't first in your life, whatever is first in your life is your God. And I remember hearing him say that, and it really rang something in me. Now, once again, if you know me, right, I can't really remember a whole lot of sermons that I've ever heard. I don't really remember a whole lot of sermons that I've preached. And so for something... Ten years later, for that phrase to still be in my consciousness means something. And so, what? What? For then, when I read this commandment, you know, have no other gods before me. It might not necessarily mean that there are these other spiritual beings out there, but we do have other gods. We do have other things in our life um, that drive us, and we put all of our energy and all of our attention into those things. And for some of us, it might be our jobs. We put all of our energy and all of our attention into our job. Because this is what I do that gives me significance. This is what I do that pays my bills. And if I can just get recognized here, then I'm going to get in more promotion. I'm going to have more money. And, and I can buy my kids stuff. Because stuff is going to replace the fact that I'm working 90 hours a week and I can't pay attention to my kids. So I might not be there. I might not be able to make it to their games and all their stuff. But at least they're going to have stuff to play with when dad's not home. Right? And so now in that sense, that person, their job is their God. Right? Um, and, and for some people, once again, love me the Bible. But a lot of what we've done in Western Christianity is we've replaced God with the Bible. The Bible is our God. We pour all our time and all our energy into the Bible. The Bible can do no wrong. The Bible is the inerrant and infallible authoritative word of God instead of Jesus Christ being the infallible and inerrant authoritative word of God. Right? And we put the Bible on our mantle. We put the Bible on our altar. Like, I remember my, 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 grand, my grandma and grandpa Clark. And the only reason why I was remembering this this morning is because that little table that Karen put in that's got the plant in it's in the, the room back there that's got the door in the front of it. My grandma and grandpa Clark had that exact same thing in, in their living room and on the inside of it they had some like games and stuff so they had this like plastic fold out thing that had slots in it you can play solitaire you put cards in there and it was like a little solitaire board they had one with like a backgammon kit and a little checkers kit a little chess kit but also in that thing was this box it was this wooden box it was like a rectangular box and it had a cross on it and I remember one day I opened it and I was like oh open it that's the bible and at the time, I didn't think much of it. Now it's like, oh, I get it. Because the Bible was the sacred thing in their house. And they put it in a nice vessel to protect it, to keep it from ever getting touched, opened, tattered, dirty. We don't read it. We've got to keep it protected in this vessel that will stop it from ever getting fingerprints on it or dust on it. I remember the quote, and I don't remember whoever said it. I think it's one of those unknown quotes, but a, a Bible that is tattered is a sign of a life that is not. Anybody ever heard that before, phrase before? A Bible that is tattered is a sign of a life that is not. Because right? once again, the Bible, it's a great thing. It's a great book. We love it. But does, has it replaced God? Do we spend all of our time trying to worship and protect the scriptures and studying and putting all of our energy and finding out what the scriptures say and proving the scriptures right or this happened and therefore this has to happen? Have we replaced God? You know, how many times you walk, drive around somewhere and you see a community Bible church? I mean, not, not a community Christ church. We're, we don't worship God here. We're a Bible church. And the first thing in our, in our doctrinal statement is the infallible and inerrant word of, of God, the Bible. It is the final authority on all matters. And I thought God was the final authority on all matters. Children. Do we make children our God? Anybody know a parent that puts all their time and all their energy into their children? protecting their children, watching over their children, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars just so their kid can get a high school diploma? I'm not talking about college. Well, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a high school diploma. Right? And their whole identity is wrapped up in their children's success and failures. I'm not, I'm not saying we're not supposed to love our children. 
But one of the things I realized is, A, who is God? Right? Now, this is a tough question. So I found out a couple weeks ago that's not that simple of an answer, right? It's not that easy, not that easy to answer. Because a lot of times when I ask somebody who is God, what I get is I get slogans and catchphrases that they've heard along the way. But they don't, and then it's just, and it becomes a slogan and a catchphrase that they heard, and then they just say it over and over and over again. And when I begin to dig and dig and dig and start throwing a hundred fastballs, a hundred miles an hour, Adam at one. Right. But when that, but, right. But when I start throwing a right. Right. But then I, and I start. Hold on. Right. A little bit. We st- we started. We, we, no, I don't want anything. I, hold on. Hold on. You're lost. You're getting lost. I don't want anything. But what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to explain to people when somebody asks us, why should I believe in God? And we want to have more than a catchphrase and a slogan. So that's one of the reasons why I throw 100 fastballs at 100 miles an hour at one time. Right? Because we got to begin to think. Because that's what the world's going to do to us. Right? And so we can ask you, who's God? And we don't always have a very simple answer. It's hard to describe. But once again, so we'll we'll just boil it down from my perspective, and this is just the way I see God. You don't need to see God this way, but I do want you starting to think about how do you describe God if somebody comes to you and says, why should I believe in God? Why is believing in God going to change my life? And you're going to give them a catchphrase and a slogan that you've heard in church your whole life, but they're going to have a rebuttal, and it's going to be really hard to push back against that because the rebuttal is coming from very sound logic. Right? And so for me, God is what? God is a divine energy source that creates and sustains everything. Right? So we believe, now not necessarily us as Christians, but what we call the scientific world. One thing I remember from science, because once again, I'm not a big science person, and I never really, wasn't really good at it, but one thing I remember always hearing from science is that energy can never be created nor destroyed. And so how I add to that is I say, humans cannot create nor destroy energy. All energy comes from one source. In my belief. You know, you have to, right? And that source for me is God. God is constantly giving his energy into his creation. Right? And that sustains us. That keeps us going. But there's a lot of things in this world that suck energy out of us. We pour all of our energy into them. We spend all of our time putting our energy. How many people get done watching the news and you feel exhausted? It just sucks the energy out of you. Putting your energy into trying to figure out, because now we have the question, is this story true or not? Or if, you know, in the 70s, when Walter Klein cried, it might have been the 60s, nobody questioned whether what he was telling you was true or not. Everybody just kind of was like, oh, this is, this is what's happening in the world now. Well, now it's like, well, is this really? Because I flipped the other channel, and they're telling me something completely different. So now we're putting all this energy in trying to be, be right. We're trying to know what's right, and it just sucks the energy out of us. Put all this energy into trying to get this new job, this new promotion, just sucks it right out of us. We have no much, no energy left for anything else. That's how I know something's not God. If it's taking my energy away from me, it's not of God. Because God gives energy. God doesn't take energy. And one thing that I found out is if I put all my energy and all my attention... And to not knowing God, but being known by God. I put God first in my life. And all my focus is on who God is and what God's doing in my life and trying to follow Christ, the hope of glory who is in me. I have a whole lot of energy for everything. I have enough energy to do everything else. I don't run out of energy. I have enough to focus on my wife and to focus on my kids and to focus on my job and to focus on all the other stuff that matters in my life. Because I'm focusing on not giving God my energy, but I'm focused on receiving energy from God. Because God is a giver. God's not a taker. But so many of us have spent so much of our life putting other gods before God. And all it does is just suck our energy out of us. And God clearly says, have no other gods before me. It's not because there are, and once again, this is my opinion... There's not all these other gods out there. And we know that there's some that are named. Are they real? Or are they just imagination? People came up with this name, Baal. We hear Baal all the time. Is Baal an actual 
God that's out there that's some sort of opposing God to, to our God? Maybe. I don't know. I also believe he might have just been a figment of imagination of people who were trying to make sense of the world and he was the way in which they could make sense of it. But what did they do? They put all their energy and all their attention in, in the bear, in the worshiping Baal. What did God do when he showed up? Freedom. Healing. Love. Grace. Kindness. Goodness. All the things we, we, we use to describe God. He didn't take from us. Go to the cross and look at the cross and listen to the example of the cross and find me how anything in that God is selfish. Because we can look at all the other gods that were worshipped in the Old Testament. All the other gods that we worship today as humans, money and all that. They're very selfish. All they do is take from us. If what you're worshipping is taking from you, then in God. Our God gives. Our God sacrifices. Our God does not require sacrifice. Our God is the sacrifice. And He's constantly sacrificing for us. He's constantly giving of Himself to us. And if we put Him first and foremost in our life, if that is what we're seeking, is God's divine energy, God's divine love, however you want to talk about it, you're going to have so much it's just going to come pouring out of you in every encounter. You're going to have more time. You're, you're going to have more, more space in your life. You know, I, I don't have time. I, I, okay, I get it. We're all busy. Understand. Life is busy. Mostly because it can be out of balance. We're putting too much time and too much energy in things that are taking from us. We put them ahead of God. I got time for God on Sunday. But Monday through Friday, I'm too busy to be thinking about who I am and why I'm here. I'm too busy trying to see if there's room in my heart for Jesus today. I'm too busy to stop and pray for Loretta who's not feeling good. I got too much going on to take time out of my day to, to give Debbie a phone call and see how her recovery is going. <laughs> Once again, I preach to me. But I said time and time, time and time again today is if, if, if God is first and primary in our life, and we're waking up in the morning, taking the time to be grateful for today, taking the time to just be still with Him and His presence for a few moments, taking the time to do some devotional reading of Scripture, taking the time to pray for our brothers and sisters who might be going through something, but maybe not going through something. Right? Just because Josh is having a great day today and things are going well for him, his job's great, family's good, doesn't mean we don't need to pray for him. Pray for it to sustain. Pray for it to keep going that way for him. All of us need prayer. Amen. Are we taking the time to do those things? Because I can promise you, if you're making that time, you're going to have time for everything else. When we put God first in our life, he makes a way for everything. You know, and I can put in that old cliche because we talked about it a couple months ago. Giving money to God, God's going to make sure you have enough. And once again, God doesn't need money. The church does. Okay? God doesn't have bills. But Grace Community Church, we have bills. Okay? And, and if you're going to make room in your budget to make sure that this church can continue going, God's going to make room in your budget to make sure everything else works out. If you're going to make room in your life for God... God's going to make sure you have room in your life for your job, room in your life for your kids, room in your life for the other things that you, you kind of want and need to do. But if you're serving another God before Him, your life is going to be out of balance. You're not going to have that time because you're wasting your energy on things that are designed to just steal it from you. But if we think about God as a divine source of energy that creates and sustains everything. 
you're always going to have enough. And if we're just focusing on Him, receiving, not giving, receiving His energy, receiving His love, receiving His grace, and we're taking those times out of our day to do those things, we'll always have enough. So whom do you seek? Are you seeking Jesus and Nazareth? And once again, when they came to Him, they said, and Jesus said, Whom do you seek? We're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. But why were they seeking Him? Why were they seeking Him? Anybody know? In that scene in the Bible, when they got Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they all come to Him, coming to arrest Him to do what? Kill Him. So are we seeking Him to kill Him? Or are we seeking Him to give Him life? And where is He? He's in me. So I'm seeking Him to give me life. Not take it. Because all those other gods in our life are taking our life from us. Jesus is, is our life. Living and flowing through us. Sustaining us. Encouraging us. Loving us. Guiding us. Directing us. I can keep going. On, on. There's more things that just keep popping up in there. So, you know, I understand that, you know, we can go on and go on. And, well, Jesus well, Jesus said the Ten Commandments, you know, aren't even. We don't have to worry about those anymore. We just have the one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, true. But some of these things still come in handy when we look back. You shall have no other gods before me. I'm pretty sure that's the one we still might want to stick to. The whole honoring your mother and father, we can get rid of that one. We don't need that one anymore. <laughs> You know, I'm just joking. Yes, yes, our kids still have to do that. We don't know. But I'm pretty sure we, we, we want to stick to some, there's some, some guidance here. And, and having no other God before him is probably a pretty good one. And, and just think about if we're if we're focusing on our God, and we're receiving his energy, we're receiving his love, we're living through our lives, making sure that we make time, to recognize, making time out of our day. Our life's going to be more balanced. You know, however you want to describe the world right now, you can look out on the world, the biggest thing you can say, the biggest way to sum it all up is the world's out of balance. Right? The way in which we live with the environment's out of balance. The way in which we, we, we live with money is out of balance. The way in which we love each other is out of balance. This world is out of balance. Well, who's the one who's supposed to bring balance to the world? Who brings balance to the world? Libras? People who were born in October because that's when the stars align and those are the people who bring balance? Uh, I don't think so. I believe we're the ones who are supposed to bring balance. The ones who recognize Christ in us, the hope of glory. The, one who, the ones who are living examples of who Christ was in this world. Who are supposed to be living examples of who Christ was in the world. We bring balance to the world when we allow Christ to live and move and breathe through us. When we receive His energy and let it flow out of us. We're bringing balance to the Force. Right? The Chosen Ones. Uh, I'm not a big Star Wars fan. I don't know why there's a Star Wars reference in there, but maybe, maybe some of you are and you get that one. I don't know. Somebody was supposed to bring balance. I know the balance of the force is out of balance, and one of somebody was supposed to come and bring balance. I don't know if it was like Luke Skywalker did. I don't know. We don't need to get into Star Wars conversation now. Rabbit trail. See how? See, I'm getting better at stopping my rabbit trails. See there, we almost went on a rabbit. I stopped it. No, we're not going to have a Star Wars conversation today. But anyway, whom do you seek? Is there room for? whom you seek and do you have other gods before God those are the questions we want to wake up tomorrow morning and ask ourselves wake up Tuesday morning and ask wake up every single morning and say whom am I going to seek today God Jesus Christ whatever, however you want to say it is there room for him in my heart today is there anything else in my life today that I'm going to put before God? 
Ask yourselves those questions every single morning when you wake up. Set the tone for your day. Don't let those other things sneak in, though, because that world is going to come bombard. As soon as you walk out that front door, somebody's going to cut you off when you're pulling out of your... And you're not seeking God at that moment. You're seeking some words to say and some fingers to put up, right? That's what happens. That's what the world does to us. If we start the day out on the right foot, we start our day out asking those three questions. We're going to be better prepared for that person they cut us off as a pulling out of our neighborhood. Man, maybe I hope they're not. I hope they're not on the way to the hospital. I hope there's not an emergency going on in their life. Maybe something's going on that they're. That's why they're in such a hurry. Let me pray for them real quick while I'm driving. It's a lot different result than just waking up in a panic, running out of the house real quick getting in your car and getting cut off because you're not in that mindset you're not wondering I wonder if something's going on in their life and that's why they're in such a hurry you're looking for what finger to put up and what words to say what names to call